Tonight, the date is set for the unprecedented criminal trial of a former president of the United States now running to return to the White House. The judge in Donald Trump's hush money case in New York ordering jury selection to begin on March 25th after refusing to dismiss the charges. Trump was in the courtroom and so was CNN's Kara Scannell. A New York state judge ordering Donald Trump to stand trial for criminal charges next month. Instead of being in South Carolina and other states campaigning, I'm stuck here. Tonight. This case related to a hush money repayment scheme involving porn star Stormy Daniels and former Trump fixer Michael Cohen will begin on March 25th. There is no case. It's a historic first, a former president facing a jury and on trial in the middle of a presidential campaign. How can you run for election to be sitting in a courthouse in Manhattan all day long? The judge in this case, Juan Mershon, made the decision after consulting with Judge Tanya Chutkin, who was overseeing the election subversion case in Washington, D.C. During a pre-trial hearing in New York, Trump attorney Todd Blanche seized on that unprecedented timing, protesting for a delay. We strenuously object to what is happening in this courtroom, he told the judge, with Trump's eyes locked on his attorney. The fact that President Trump is going to now spend the next two months working on this trial instead of out in the campaign trail running for president is something that should not happen in this country. What's your legal argument, Judge Mershon asked. That's my legal argument, Trump's lawyer responded. That's not a legal argument, Mershon replied, telling the lawyers he'd see them on March 25th. We'll just have to figure it out. I'll be here during the day and I'll be campaigning during the night. This case stems from actions that took place in the days before the 2016 election, when Donald Trump, former National Enquirer publisher David Pecker, and Michael Cohen allegedly schemed to keep Stormy Daniels from going public about an affair. According to the indictment, Cohen paid $130,000 in hush money to Stormy Daniels, then submitted sham legal bills to the Trump Organization, which the former president reimbursed with a series of monthly checks. I did it at the direction of, in concert with, and for the benefit of Donald J. Trump. Today, the parties debated questions to ask prospective jurors, and 18 person ultimately be seated. Trump's lawyers wanted to delve into politics, telling the judge they need to know if people like Trump. Judge Mershon called it inappropriate, saying they need fair and impartial jurors. I'm honored to sit here day after day after day on something that everybody says the greatest legal scholars say, it's not even a crime. Now, it will be a jury that decides whether or not Donald Trump committed a crime. If he is convicted, he could face time in prison. Now, Brianna, it was almost one year ago that in the courthouse behind me, a grand jury handed up the first indictment of a former president and soon another historic first, the first criminal trial. Brianna? Lots of firsts. Kara, thank you for that report. Let's bring in... Cordero and David Chalian to talk about this a little bit more. I mean, only on a day like today would this get a little bit lost, right? Uh, when we saw what happened down in Georgia. But Trump, this is huge. He's going to be standing trial in a criminal case next month. It is official. Uh, so how big of a deal is this? And is there any chance that this could slide time-wise? So time-wise, it seems like this probably is the schedule. Um, I don't see something in the federal case getting accelerated that would bump it again so this as far as we can tell this looks like this will be the date for it to uh, to it to, for it to start but in terms of the substance of it it is sort of amazing that this is the case that is going to be the first one in the history books against a former president at least in my judgment of all the cases this is the weakest one substantively I mean the facts are now eight years old by the time we're actually getting to trial um, the case is on an, sort of an interesting legal theory in order to jack it up to a felony charge in terms of what otherwise would have been misdemeanors, uh, falsification of records. So there is a, a lift that the prosecutors are going to have to do in order to actually successfully execute this trial and win at trial. But the fact that it is taking place, of course, is significant. That point, that this is the weakest of the cases, coupled with the timing here, right, that the jury selection begins on March 25th, and by then Trump could already have enough delegates to be the presumptive GOP nominee. So how does that change the dynamics here politically for him? Well, think about it, Brianna. Uh, 
when you become the presumptive nominee, that's a term of art, right? Yeah, but Super Tuesday is March 5th, right? That's where the largest prize of delegates are. A couple weeks after that on March 19th, there are some very big states with a lot of delegates, Florida, Illinois, Ohio. So it is possible, given that Nikki Haley is running so far behind him, that he will have amassed enough delegates to hit the threshold of 1,215 delegates you need to be the presumptive nominee. So what happens when you become the presumptive nominee like that? Well, normally, after you hold a big press event to say that you've become the presumptive nominee, you are fully pivoting all your attention to now, every day, combating in the general election, in this case, against Joe Biden. That's not going to be Donald Trump's schedule. Now, I understand. He's turning the courtroom into the campaign trail, and he's going to make the case against Biden uh, from press conference out, outside of court. But his time is going to be spent in that courtroom as a criminal defendant precisely at the moment that any other candidate would normally be amassing their general election team, getting out to every battleground state, and really launching the most uh, concerted part of the campaign. Yeah, he is going to have to focus on this. At the same time, as you mentioned, it's it's the weakest of the cases. And then you have the fact that we're watching this case in Georgia that has become a little bit tarnished uh, by what has happened with Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade. And then you have the her report on Biden that maybe not legally, but at least politically, you have Republicans using to invalidate the Trump case when it comes to documents. All of those things together, what, yeah, what I, effect do you see that having? Well, I think each of the cases has been shipped away in different ways. So um, if you take the her report first, I've always thought that the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case is the strongest criminal case against the former president. Um, but there were a couple things in that report that I think potentially he will use as defenses. I don't think they'll be successful, but for example, um, the fact that the report talked about other presidents, in particular former President Reagan, keeping personal notebooks. The Trump case is different. It's not about notebooks, it's about documents. But I think that sort of historical part that other presidents were lax in some ways with classified documents will be in his favor. The Georgia case, we'll have to see what the judge decides in terms of uh, whether he disqualifies the DA, but that case is definitely in a different place than it was when she first brought it. So much to follow. Thank you so much to both of you sure. for helping us do it here.